power. There's a huge population of Maritimers with Celtic roots, and that means there is a huge population of Maritimers with a genetic disorder known as hemochromatosis. The genetic mutation is common in people with ancestors from Ireland, Wales, Scotland, or Great Britain. And if you have it, your body stores iron, and iron overload can damage your organs. It's Canada's most common genetic disorder, and today we're going to learn more about it. Bob Rogers is the executive director of the Canadian Hemochromatosis Society. He's in our Sydney studio today. Welcome to Maritime Noon. Good afternoon, normally. Good to have you here. Thank you. So if you have questions about hemochromatosis and what to expect if you have it, give us a call. We've opened our lines. It's toll-free anywhere in the Maritimes, 1-800-565-1940. In the Halifax area, call us at 420-9336. You can also send us an email with your questions, marnoon at cbc.ca, or tweet us at CBC Maritime Noon. So, Bob, uh, what do we know about the origination of hemochromatosis. How far does it go back? Well, probably back to the Vikings, uh, normally, when they were warring with uh, one another um, and losing lots of blood in that warfare. Uh, they Their bodies adapted in order to replenish the red blood cells quicker so they could heal faster. And uh, when they stopped warring amongst each other but started uh, moving abroad and conquering other other nations. You mentioned some of them, the certainly the uh, British Isles, but then they went into northern Europe and as far south actually as the, um, northern Italy and northern Portugal and the western Baltic states. They, uh, they left uh, their remnants of their gene in the population that they conquered. And uh, as these people uh, then inherited the genetic disorder, uh, they mo- we moved um, as a population from those areas to the New World about 450 years ago. So in Australia, New Zealand, and North America, parts of South America, and uh, parts of North and South Africa, and still in the British Isles, and Europe, and uh, parts of Scandinavia, even Iceland, uh, we find this genetic disorder exists. So it started with the the survivors, the ones who could store enough iron to survive after losing all this blood. Um, This genetic mutation happened, and that's why uh, why it's so common today. That's right. That's why the genetic disorder is in. And then uh, what we did is we started eating more iron about 200 years ago. So uh, this uh, genetic disorder now is absorbing all that extra iron we eat. And what exactly happens here? You know, why, why does the body store too much iron if you have this gene? Well, people with hemochromatosis would absorb two to four times the amount of dietary iron uh, as opposed to someone who doesn't have the disorder uh, because uh, those who are unaffected, the excess iron is... um, Uh, disposed of through the bowel, but uh, those who are absorbing too much. It goes into the liver primarily, and then when the liver can hold no more, uh, it starts depositing that iron in the vital organs of the body. And it's when that happens that we start seeing the suffering occur and uh, the related diseases that occur from too much iron in the body. Okay, so how do you know if your body's doing that? Well, you would have some of the simple symptoms in the beginning, which are generally quite vague, um, chronic fatigue, joint pain, uh, arthritis, uh, abdominal pain and bloating of the abdominal area, uh, menstrual irregularities, loss of body hair, loss of libido, impotence, sudden weight loss, thyroid problems, depression or mood swings. Those would be some of the softer Um, um, symptoms that one might experience. Um, As this disorder progresses through the body, however, you might have elevated liver enzymes, which is a good signal that uh, something uh, wrong is going on in the liver. Uh, Elevated triglyceride levels, uh, glucose levels uh, rising to the point of uh, adult uh, onset type 2 diabetes. Then the liver starts to become diseased, so an enlarged liver, cirrhosis, uh, even liver cancer once it gets to that, uh, a severe level, an irregular heart 
heartbeat leading to congestive heart failure uh, and a disease of the heart muscle called cardiomyopathy and, and other ones I just haven't mentioned. Well, it sounds, you know, completely devastating. So, but you, you put hemochromatosis at the root of many of these problems? Absolutely. And, and, and the, the important thing is, is that if you have two or three of these symptoms, you should be going to your family physician and that uh, the physician should be doing two simple blood tests that would determine whether iron overload is at the cause. Okay, so what are those blood tests? What should you be asking for? The two tests that are necessary to get are a serum ferritin, and that measures the amount of uh, iron in that protein that is resident in the body, and a transferrin saturation percentage, which measures the amount of that in transport uh, throughout the body. Okay. But isn't there a genetic test that you need to have to determine whether you have hemochromatosis? Yes, normally. Uh, if both of those tests, which I've just mentioned, are elevated, then the genetic test, which was um, uh, found in 1998, would confirm the clinical diagnosis of hemochromatosis. Okay. We're taking your calls today. If you have questions about hemochromatosis, if you've been diagnosed, or perhaps you're wondering if, if you might might be suffering from this, give us a call at 1-800-565-1940 or 420-9336 if you're in Halifax. You can also send your questions to us by email. Marnoon at cbc.ca will get them through. And we do have a question uh, by email from Gail Davis in Hans County. She says... Uh, she has hemochromatosis. So do two of my three sons. I have a suspicion that my maternal grandfather died of it back in the 50s. However, we've all been genetically tested and the test has been negative. Do you have any explanations for this? So can you, can you say that you have hemochromatosis if the testing was negative? Well, um, I don't know what she means by all have been tested. Uh, for her children to have uh, hemochromatosis, two out of three, and we're speaking about hereditary hemochromatosis here, um, uh, Gail would at least have to be a, well, she has it, so she has two copies of the gene, and her husband would have to have at least one. Uh, so the genetic testing should have confirmed those, uh, those findings. Okay. So how does that work? Can you be test positive for the gene and not have it yourself? Can you be a carrier? You can be a carrier. That's correct. So one gene is a carrier status. You, you, we, we get two genes, one from our mother, one from our father, and uh, when, when we make up our DNA. So in the case of Gail, she has two genes. Well, she would pass w that are mutated for hemochromatosis because she has it. So she would pass one gene uh, to her children, and then it would be up to the father to pass on uh, either a normal gene or an abnormal gene. And for the children to have hereditary hemochromatosis, the father would have to have at least one gene. And one would suspect that uh, if, ev if all have been genetically tested, that he would have to come up with at least one gene. Okay. So just because you have it, it you, you has to be both, both parents have to have be either a carrier or a have it is, is the bottom line. Okay. That's, that's correct. Okay. Virginia Taylor is on the line with us from Windsor, Nova Scotia, with a question. Hi, Virginia. Hi there. Thanks for the call. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, um, I have hemochromatosis in the family. Uh, one of my sisters is up in the 1200s, another in the 600s, and my count is 325. Is that... A concerning level. Okay, what count do you mean? The, the iron count? I don't know. Okay, what's so that, the terminology there, Bob? That sounds like a serum ferritin to me, and uh, three, the normal range for women is 20 to 250. So 325 is slightly elevated. Virginia, what is your age, please? I'm 70. 
Yes, well, I would not uh, think that this is hereditary hemochromatosis, or that number would be uh, usually much higher. Uh, what we know about a serum ferritin, which is elevated all by itself, is that this could be an acute phase reactant, which is similar to a, um, a high temperature. It, uh, it indicates that uh, something in your body's going on, so at high temperature would be an infection, and a slightly elevated ferritin such as yours might be an indication that there's some kind of inflammation present. Okay. Okay, now my sister, who is 60. Five, when she was 62, was uh, diagnosed with too high an iron count, and she was in the 1,200. Now that's no, she was in the 600, sorry. Okay, well, again, uh, I think you had one of your uh, relatives who had hemochromatosis. Uh, which relative was that? Uh, a sister. So the sister has 12, the one who had 1,200. Um, when I said 12, I'm not sure if I remember that correctly, but two sisters have undergone bloodletting as a therapy. Okay. Well, um, the, the, the standard classical investigation into this disorder is that if one person has been clinically diagnosed in the family with hereditary hemochromatosis, all first relatives mother, father, siblings, children, uh, should go directly to genetic testing in order to find out who has the genes for this disorder. And then once the gene pattern has been established, then this, the two tests I mentioned in the beginning, the serum ferritin and the transferrin saturation are done. So in your case, Virginia, uh, uh, all first relatives, meaning uh, you're certainly one of them, should have gone to a genetic test. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. And, and uh, your doctor should be able to do that uh, on request. And if you have any difficulty with that, uh, we can assist the physician by giving them a protocol that they can follow. And you could call us at uh, our office at one eight seven seven bad iron and pick up a copy of that. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you, Virginia, for the question. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Virginia mentioned um, the, the treatment for hemochromatosis, bloodletting, and I want to talk about that uh, in just a moment with you and explore just what, what you can do if you've been told you have hemochromatosis. We'll get to that in just a moment. My guest is Bob Rogers from the Canadian Hemochromatosis Society. We're taking your questions about hemochromatosis today, 1-800-565-1940 or 420-9336 if you're in the Halifax area. Area. You can also email me your questions, marnoon at cbc.ca. Back in just a moment, but first, this news update. Hi there. In the news this hour, an apple orchard in Nova Scotia's Annapolis Valley has been quarantined by federal officials. Apple proliferation phytoplasma is the reason. They say it's an organism that hurts the variety gala and has been found in North America for the first time. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says the farm is near Kentville and they've contacted their counterparts in the U.S., in Cape Breton, dozens of people needing CT scans are being told they'll have to wait. That's because of a shortage of dye that's used to enhance the images created by the scanner. A spokesperson for the health authority says there's still enough of it for emergency CT scans, and they should have the supply of the agent topped up by mid-June. And on Prince Edward Island, RCMP have released the name of a man who died Friday night in an off-highway vehicle rollover in Mount Vernon. Police say 32-year-old Stephen Douglas Glenn Palmer was pronounced dead at the scene. Kings District RCMP continue to investigate the cause of the crash. And those are the headlines. All right. Thank you, Sarah. That's Sarah Halliburton in our newsroom. 1-800-565-1940 or 420-9336. If you have questions about a very common genetic disorder, hemochromatosis, that's when your body stores too much iron, give us a call and uh, we'll try to get those answers for you. My guest is Bob Rogers from the Canadian Hemochromatosis Society. And just before the, the news break, Bob, I mentioned that the treatment is bloodletting. So it sounds kind of savage, but we're just we give blood and that keeps our levels down our levels of iron down it in, in fact some people refer to it as archaic yes we used to uh, take blood by leeches and, and all of that sort of thing and uh, that was thought to be healthy we don't do that much anymore good uh, yes <laughs> um, but bloodletting works because what happens is you take the red blood cells out with a pint of blood out of the body and uh, when you do that the body has to find iron to make new red blood cells iron is matched with oxygen and 
and that's what makes up a, a red blood cell. So it's the leaching out of the iron through this process, uh, taking blood out, uh, the body having to use iron to make more red blood cells, and then taking more blood out. And in the beginning, a person who's been uh, diagnosed with uh, hemochromatosis might have to give a pint of blood twice a week for well over a year. Uh, I met a man here over the weekend, in fact, yesterday, who was diagnosed with an 8,400 ferritin. Oh. And he was giving uh, blood um, uh, twice a week for almost a year and a half. Now he's been successfully de-ironed and his first regular uh, blood donation, that is uh, once about every three to four months, uh, is uh, going to be done. And, uh, and that's what you would do for the rest of your life. When you need a treatment, you go and give a pint of blood. And instead of giving it at the hospital, which is what's done in the de-ironing process in the beginning, uh, you can go to the Canadian Blood Services. And we are national partners for life with Canadian Blood Service and give your blood there. And the blood can go on to save three more lives. So it's nothing wrong with that blood. Absolutely not. Yeah. You don't have a blood disorder. You have a iron metabolism disorder. It must be exhausting to, to give blood two times a week, you know, for a year and a half. It is. And, and, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, have to take time off of work while they go through that. I knew a firefighter in uh, Winnipeg who uh, was off the job for a year and a half. Ivan Doncaster, who is a member of the um, uh, CBRM, the Cape Britain Municipal Council uh, here in Sydney, uh, was off the job as an elected uh, uh, individual for uh, one full term until he was able to go back and serve again. So this robs people, this disorder even prior to treatment, robs people of their vitality, their vibrancy, their contribution to their family and their community. And once we get it uh, diagnosed uh, and, and treated, then people can get back. Ivan's now back on council and this firefighter's back at work. Oh, that's, that's good news. All right, Paul is on the line with a question. Hi, Paul. How are you doing, Normally? I'm well. What was your question? Uh, my question is to Bob. I have half a mutation for hemochromatosis, and I'm just wondering uh, what recommendations you could pass along that I may uh, follow. My ferritin, serum ferritin, that's hard to say, was around 840. Half a mutation. Half a mutation, that's Okay, correct. what's that all mean, Bob? So uh, I guess what that means, Paul, is that you carry one gene. Is that what, what you mean correct. by half a mutation? Yeah. You know? Well, Paul, um, uh, what else? Uh, what was your transferrin saturation? Do you remember? I believe it was last year. It was around eight forty, I think. No, or... that's your serum ferritin. Okay. What was your the the percentage of transferrin saturation would have been expressed as two numbers uh, as an, a percentage? So I think what, it was remember? around. Uh, it was in the safer area, I was told. But I get uh, tired a lot and a lot of warm. I get warm really easy. Paul, I'm going to say that it seems to me that uh, if your transferrin saturation is normal and you're just a carrier, uh, meaning only one of these mutated genes, uh, as I was explaining earlier to Virginia, you might be having an acute phase reactant and you need to be referred to an internist who can do further investigation around inflammation. But you don't think it's it's not hemochromatosis? Because, I don't think it is yeah. in this case. Okay. No, they did. Did the uh, the test and everything, and it came out happy mutation. Hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. One eight hundred five six five nineteen forty or four two zero nine three three six. If uh, you have a question about hemochromatosis, you've been you've been saying too that people have hereditary hemochromatosis. Is there any other kind? There's acquired hemochromatosis, and that is if you uh, if you live next to an iron smelter and you're breathing in that air uh, constantly, then you could absorb uh, too much iron from the from the air. If you're taking iron Iron supplements. Uh, you know, I remember years ago when I was very young, they used to advertise Geritol on television, and that was something that essentially that was liquid iron if, if you felt sort of tired all the time. And people usually think that if they're tired, they should be taking some sort of iron. Um, and so people can overdose on this. Iron is toxic and it can build up uh, too much in the body. But if you discontinue these activities, if you move 
move away from the iron smelter or stop taking iron supplements, your levels would return to normal in due course. Well, Phil Millard uh, has emailed with this question. He says he has hemochromatosis, and he wonders if you can comment on diet and what foods to avoid. During, uh, thank you for that question, Phil. During the de-ironing process, we certainly make some recommendations around uh, lowering your iron intake uh, because we want to take that iron out of your body very quickly. So we would suggest you're not eating a lot of red meat. You cut back on that. You stop uh, eating breakfast cereals, which are very rich in iron. Uh, ideally, by the way, you wouldn't be taking vitamin C or or fruit that uh, has a lot of vitamin C during your meals. You would eat that uh, between meals because vitamin C helps absorb uh, iron. Um, we would also encourage you not to take alcohol because alcohol will also uh, contribute to overabsorption. Um, uh, raw seafood uh, would not be good to eat during that time because of the bacteria, and bacteria likes to live off of a uh, high iron environment. Um, you remember the listeriosis breakout? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the uh, bacteria on that meat wouldn't have been unhealthy for a person in a high iron environment. So these are all things that are all about uh, de-ironing, the initial stage. Um, oh, by the way, stay away from game meat because game meat has nine times the amount of iron in it uh, during that period of time. But after you get into maintenance, you can return to a relatively normal diet uh, recommended by the Canadian Health uh, Guide. And uh, the only thing we would say about alcohol then is uh, as long as your liver is not compromised, you could uh, turn to uh, return again to a moderate use of alcohol. Okay, Barry Johnson is next. He's uh, on the road outside of Edmonston, New Brunswick. Hi, Barry. Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. What's your question? Uh, I have a two-part question. One is, what is the safe level or what is the, the saturation level percentage that you should be to be bled off? And the other part is, uh, I was it was recommended that I have a liver biopsy to uh, check my liver. Is, is this always necessary? Barry, um, the levels, the safe levels or the normal levels for serin ferritin for men are 20 to 300 for women 20 to 250 um, anything over that is elevated s uh, s the transferrin saturation percentage 45 percent or less is normal 55 uh, percent and over is elevated and when those two tests as I've said before are elevated then the genetic test meaning that you'd have to have two copies usually of the C282Y uh, gene would um, would uh, confirm the clinical diagnosis of hemochromatosis. So then the next question is, is how uh, helpful is having a liver biopsy? Before we had the genetic test, uh, there were a lot of liver biopsies done. And the purpose of the liver biopsy is to determine whether there's any uh, cirrhosis in the liver. So if you, are, if you present to your physician that you have used an immoderate amount of alcohol or that you've had this condition for a long time, a prudent uh, use of a liver biopsy might be helpful. However, there are some non-invasive imaging that can be done. And uh, there are um, scans that uh, can be uh, ordered by a gastroenterologist that would uh, be less invasive. And uh, I would certainly recommend that you would try and find a physician who would put you through that regimen first. Uh, before a liver biopsy is done. And you would want the, those results to figure out if your liver has been damaged? Is that basically what, what they would be determining? That's correct. They're looking for cirrhosis and potential liver cancer, depending upon uh, how late uh, of a diagnosis that this has uh, 
has occurred. The primary age where we want to have people diagnosed is 20 to 35 years of age. It's after that in men that, uh, that they start to uh, exhibit the serious symptoms and the damage in the, in the organs once the ferritin gets over a thousand. In women, because they menstruate and, uh, and uh, also have children, bear children, uh, they're naturally protected until perimenopause or menopause because they're losing blood uh, normally. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Barry, for the question. Thank you. All right, let's go to Marie Hanna in St. John. Hi, Marie. Hi there. Hi. Uh, what was your question about hemochromatosis? Uh, my sister and her husband both have hemochromatosis. Is this ordinary that both would have it? Well, they must have been attracted to one another, both carrying magnets. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, ma- <laughs> I, depend- I guess it just depends who you marry, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's, that's it. Yeah. Yes, that is. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. it's the selection uh, process. I met uh, one other family like this in St. John's, uh, Newfoundland, and uh, both their children end up with hemochromatosis because the parents have no other normal gene to give. They've got two abnormal genes each so they have to pass on an abnormal gene to their children and for uh, so in in this case that you can see how critical it is to have all of the family siblings and children uh, genetically tested to confirm all this hmm. okay. so all of the family sh- and and their children Elaine my sister's children should be tested for it yes and they, you should be tested for it as well yeah I didn't realize that because uh, if your sister has two copies, then, uh, you, you know, your mother and father uh, passed both of them on to her, and you're at risk. Right. And uh, their carriers, I know she is for sure. I'm not sure about he, whether he's a carrier or he does have it. Now, they go to the Canadian Blood Service to uh, have blood taken. Now, why is it that they can, if they're carriers, they can use that blood sample to donate blood, if, but if they actually have it, they can't? Actually, they can, and this is a, a misunderstanding that the Canadian Blood Services, uh, unfortunately, had under uh, recently, up till recently. But the new criteria book uh, that was issued about six months ago with the Canadian Blood Services right across the country indicates that people with hemochromatosis can give blood, carriers or the people who have two g- uh, genes for this disorder can give blood to the Canadian Blood Services as as long as they do not have insulin dependent diabetes or uh, liver uh, difficulties uh, disease okay or fine. cancer of course and 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 they have to be um, uh, otherwise qualified. You know, if you go to somewhere in the world where malaria is present, I think anyone cannot give for up to a year. Right, is that right? I tried to get her, but she was out. I wanted her to phone in herself. But thank you very much for the information. Yeah, well, make sure all of your siblings and their children all of get my tested. All siblings okay. as well? All, yes, it's your sister, right? So She's my all, sister. So all of so your all siblings. Of family. And yeah, then what all, about my children? All of your siblings uh, need to get tested. But what, and her children? We'll wait and see and, how her Well, tests. wait and see yeah. what happens to you, Marie. Okay. And then if you end up with two genes absolutely, uh, that are mutated for this, absolutely your children need to be tested. Okay. All right. Thank good. you for the Thank question, Marie. Thank you very Marie. much. All right. Have a Bye good day. Now. Joan Johnson uh, is on the line from Indian Harbor, Nova Scotia. Hello, Joan. Hello. Hi. What's your question? I have hemochromatosis. I've had it for a number of years now, and I wonder if uh, the symptom of having it is being cold all the time. Um, I I don't think that that's a normal, um, um, or, or I shouldn't say a normal. It's not, <laughs> not a symptom that is that is associated with hemochromatosis. One of the things I usually say when I do public presentations, and I'm by the way, if I may say, I'm I'm doing a public presentation in Halifax at uh, at the uh, Hilton Airport in uh, Wednesday night, tomorrow night at seven o'clock, and everyone is welcome. 
welcome in the Halifax area to come out to that. Um, so if, if, if you're interested in further information, I'll be there. Um, but um, the fact is, uh, we have uh, a, a lot of people with this disorder and... Um, and we need to make sure that everyone gets the proper test. Uh, as far as the cold symptom, not something that happens. And usually what I mention to people is that you can have hemochromatosis and all of its associated symptoms, but you can have other things that affect your health as well and so, uh, or your well-being. And it, isn't have, it doesn't have anything to do with hemochromatosis, but whatever that other thing is. Right, exactly. Okay, Una Linehan has a question as well about another symptom. Hi, Una. Hi. Hi. What were you wondering about? I have hemochromatosis, and um, I have a 12-year-old daughter. I was wondering what age she should be tested. Two schools of thought on that. Again, um, in the public system, you probably, uh, they're going to require that your child uh, gets... um, uh, age of consent, uh, so over 18, um, before a, they'll do a genetic test on your daughter. When that genetic test is done in the public system, that becomes part of the public medical record. And uh, therefore, if you go to apply for insurance after that, uh, and all of the tests have been done, uh, if she has hemochromatosis, that's something that you're going to have to uh, make clear to the insurance company and that right. may cause yeah. her to be either be rated or denied or have some conditions put on her insurance. However, there is a private um, a genetic testing lab. You can find more about this uh, on our website, which is too much iron. Mm-hmm. CA. And it's with uh, Gene Track Biolabs, and, and you actually mouth swab your daughter, and you send that off into their lab. They'll do the test, send the result back to you confidentially within 10 days. And uh, then if the, your daughter has two genes, well, she's merely at risk. She hasn't had a confirmed diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So now you can go out and acquire the insurance that you need to have uh, for your daughter uh, before you would... Uh, go on and do further testing to find out whether that's uh, the case. And that's entirely ethical because uh, only 75% of people who have the two genes uh, would express the disorder. So you oh, that's can, great advice. You can apply for that insurance. So if you need that mm-hmm. package, uh, you can uh, contact my office at the 1-800 number I gave you, one eight seven seven bad iron and uh, we can mail that to you and you can process it from there and uh, or wait until your daughter is over 18 and then get it through the public system. Okay. Just another question. Um, fatigue, that was the only symptom I had when I was diagnosed many years ago. I go regularly and give blood at the blood donor clinic, and but I still am always feeling fatigued. What are and you the, keeping your ferritin level at, Una? Well, I don't necessarily get it checked every time, but I've been checked at least yearly, and it's it's within normal range. Is it closer, is it to 50, which is where we recommend uh, people with hemochromatosis to keep their ferritin level, hovering around 50 nanograms per milliliter? Okay, 50. So that's what I should be checking for? That's what you should be aiming for. When you get up to around 70 nanograms per milliliter, you should be giving a pint of blood, either, uh, and Canadian Blood Services is a great place to give it. Well, uh, I go every and- 56 days. Hmm. Well, no, you see, if you do it by the calendar, you might be overbleeding yourself, which uh, doesn't... Oh, okay. uh, so you need to check it. You, you really need to check your ferritin, not do it according to a calendar. Okay. So when so, your ferritin gets up to around 70, uh, then you give a pint of blood, that brings it down to about 40, and, and that usually takes roughly uh, three to four months. Hmm. Okay. So, the, so the fatigue could possibly be related to over? Could be over, over. or under. Over or under. Could be over or under. What we're trying to achieve in maintenance is that your hemoglobin stays normal. Mm -hmm. uh, So in the normal range, which for women is uh, 120 to 160 or 12 to 16, um, uh, depending upon the measurement you use, and that your ferritin hovers around 50 and your transferrin saturation is leveling off between 30 and 40%. Okay. Okay, great. I hope that helps. 
Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. And by the way, the lady who said she feels cold all the time, I feel that, too. Really? I don't know if that's a coincidence, Ah, but, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank Thank you you for the call. Um, So should everybody, I mean, the the Red Cross encourages everybody to give blood regularly, you know, for, for, for the reason that it saves lives. If we were all giving blood regularly, would we have any problem with hemochromatosis? Well, that's a good question normally, um, I, and I don't have the facts or figures, but it, it, it seems to make sense that if we were constantly losing blood somehow, hmm. <laughs> we would keep our iron stores low. But uh, there are a lot of women in our society that have low hemoglobin and are anemic. And so I'm not sure that everyone should jump on the bandwagon um, and give blood. Um, I think it's very important for us to know what our what our health is like. And I think we need to take the appropriate steps for it. And uh, giving blood to the Canadian Blood Services is great um, when we need to especially. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Debbie Dunn uh, has a question for us. She's in Prospect. Hi, Debbie. Hi, how are you? Good. What's your question? Uh, my, I, myself and my two siblings um, both have hereditary hemochromatosis. Um, two of us have ferritin levels that require us to have bloodletting. And I was wondering why the other sister does not. So she doesn't have to have phlebotomies. Okay. Right. Well, uh, as I said before, um, the, and she has two genes, right, Debbie? Yes, that's what I'm, I'm understanding now. I was diagnosed with the homozygous, is that Yes, the homozygous for C282Y. That correct. Mm-hmm. And they were tested as well. Now, I don't know, I didn't hear the phrase homozygous, but they were um, diagnosed as having the, the hemochromatosis. So it depends on what genes you have, and, and that okay. would be very important to know. Um, it would also depend on what are some of the other um, health factors uh, that are associated with your sister who uh, doesn't uh, seem to need to give blood uh, in order to stay at a, a good level. Uh, we, we would need to investigate that a little bit more, and we certainly invite those kinds of questions again at our support line number which is one eight seven seven bad iron okay this is very prevalent normally in the maritimes because of the celtic and and uh, european northern european population and this is affecting not the one in 300 that is the national average but somewhere around one in 200 while i've been down here in the maritimes i've met an awful lot of people who have this disorder and uh, we're going to do more work down here uh, our society is going to get involved and uh, and do a lot more work well it's great to hear from you and thank Thank you for being our guest today and uh, that you're at the Hilton Airport uh, Hotel tomorrow at 7? That's correct. In Halifax. That's correct. And we'll be giving, a, it's about an hour and a half presentation, PowerPoint presentation, very informative. And we like to meet people who have this or their families and especially the younger members of the family to make sure that we can get them educated. Thank you so much. My guest today was Bob Rogers. He's the executive director of the Canadian Hemochromatosis Society. If you missed any of the program or want to listen again or share it with a friend, we'll post it on our website in about an hour's time. That's cbc.ca slash maritime news.